you, you, you are a great, well, you're involved heavily in the arts, aren't you? I know you play various musical instruments, mm -hmm. whatever, and you talked about programming being an art, and mm -hmm. also, but you're obviously you're a scientist. Is it is programming an art or is it a science? Because obviously there are very strict rules, which would mean surely it's a science, but it's truly a both. flair to it. Yeah, it's truly both. I think it's true of engin any engineering topic. If I look at this building, for example, there's a particular architectural style associated with it, and the architect who designed it would have had a, a range of possibilities. I could have had, you know, modern French bordello look or, you know, Grecian urns all over the place. So there is always, in the presence of engineering, the opportunity for degrees of freedom of creativity like that. And the same is true of software. There is an irreducible kernel of complexity in every software intensive system that demands that kind of innovation. It's truly inescapable. There still is a lot in software that is purely mechanistic and one must have the technical chops to carry them out, but it really is the two that play together. Okay. Now, I remember you spoke before that you were a big proponent of, of all things Apple. Yes. Is that still the case, or have you have you mixed your ecosystem up at all? I have some Linux boxes now. Okay. <laughs> so, um, what's what's going to be next for you? What are you going to do apart from building the human brain out of software? I think that'll keep me busy for the rest of the week at least. Okay. I'm not sure what happens after that, though. Uh, clearly, though, the work we're doing on the documentary is is going to one that be one that will consume me for a while. Yeah. Uh, this is a journey my wife and I started about five years ago, mm -hmm. in conjunction with the Computer History Museum. Um, and really, it's a story that's a global story. So we hope to be able to tell the elements from uh, from the UK that uh, it has it has changed the way computing is. Uh, we have some great connections with the good folks at Bletchley Park, and mm -hmm. it's not just that, but but there are many other stories that come from here that will be in it. Uh, in addition to the five one-hour episodes we're planning, we have a, a book, a book series, app, website, but basically trying to open it up for the general public. And that will consume me for a while. That'll take care of the following week. Okay, <laughs> good, I'm glad about that. Uh, you also touched on the uh, Internet of Things. Yes. Now, obviously that's gonna take computing even further out into society. Mm -hmm. I just wonder what your, what your general feelings are on, on that, as, a, as, a, that as, a, as an idea. Well, I'll address it from, from a societal perspective and a technical perspective. Mm -hmm. From the technical perspective, it introduces some interesting challenges because now we're talking about billions upon billions of low power devices that have little bits of software in them. And programming them is, is like working in an island that's connected with lots of other landscapes. So the problem of developing them is they must be built in the presence of a larger ecosystem because by themselves they're not that interesting, mm -hmm. but it's where they fit in the larger ecosystem that makes sense. So we're going to see a, a class of developers really already emerging who have the skills to build very, very small, uh, small devices, both memory and power constraint. And that, that's skills quite different than the average web, web developer has. From the societal perspective, it really goes back to the perspective of the notion of ambient computing, that these devices will be all around us. They'll be in our, our doorknobs or individual lights. We, we, in fact, there, there exists a line of light bulbs that are internet ready. Each individual light bulb can be addressable. Uh, this, in fact, has led to one of the reasons why uh, we moved from IPv4 to IPv6 in the addressing, because if you have, well, when the internet was first devised, no one ever imagined there would be so many devices. But now we have enough that I think the calculation was it's about as many as there are grains of sand in the earth. So right. this will last us for a while. Okay. So off the back of that, all of these devices will be creating data. Mm -hmm. How are we going to deal with that, and how are we going to address the issue of, of who has this data? I mean, you could have, you know, somebody was talking about the statistics emanating from their IP-enabled toaster. Yes. You know, how are we how are we going to possibly deal with it? Because I mean, we're talking about big data now, and we're getting terabytes and petabytes of data. Right. It's just going to grow even bigger. So yes. how, how are we going to be able to deal with all these? So I'll use an American phrase here that I think the aphorism goes, 80% of everything is crap, including this statement, of course. <laughs> and so even though we're generating lots and lots of data, a lot of it is noise as well, too. Yeah. Now, the NSA may care about when I'm toasting my toast, because they may find patterns in my life that are important to them. Mm -hmm. But by and large, it's those small things that, yes, it generates data, but it may not be that interesting for us. Um, 
still it is the case we are in an era where we're generating lots and lots of information. The challenge is not just crunching all of it, but being very wise about the information we do select. And that's, that's one of the challenges of the big data analytics these days. Okay, so it's sorting and cleats from the... It, precisely. The world has always been complex. Now the societal implication is what does this mean relative to our privacy? Um, one could make the case, and I do sometimes, that the privacy that we have experienced in our generation has been an aberration. If you look at the kinds of privacy one had in a small city, in a small town, uh, back in the Middle Ages, really for most of the duration of, of human, human life, we've had very little privacy because your neighbors would know what you were doing, they could hear you through the windows, uh, you would live in large groups where you had very little privacy, but it's really only been in the last generation or two where we've had extreme privacy like we have now. So that may be an aberration. It's also the case that there are degrees that I think an individual deserves privacy, and yet we're at the point now, because of ambient computing and the generation of shedding off so, so much information, there is this friction upon what the human individual desires and what actually we broadcast to the world. And again, being you know, confident that we'll work our way out here, I think we will, but we're in a period where there is intense friction between those two. Because I've, I've heard people discuss maybe we should move towards uh, transparency. So the data's out there. Mm -hmm. You just know who's doing what with your data. Perfect transparency would be wonderful, except that governments tend to prefer asymmetric transparency, yes. meaning you, we want you to be entirely transparent, but I'm not going to be transparent. And it's also the case, you can make a case that transparency is not always necessarily good. I'll give you an example. My wife and I uh, volunteer to watch over monk seals in Maui. Uh, monk seals are a highly in, in endangered species. Within all of the world, there are maybe 1,400 of them. We know, and through public agencies, where certain seals are at a moment in time, where they're giving birth, where they're molting, that's visible information. And yet, for protecting the seal, there's actually value in hiding that information because we need to have privacy for the seals. So they can go off and do what they need to do as opposed to letting lots of individuals go around them and bother them. So you can make a case that transparency, 100% transparency, really doesn't work. So we have to find the right, right middle ground. Okay. Brilliant. Grady, thank yes. you very much for speaking to You're us. welcome. And I hope that you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.